podcasting from Dallas, Texas. I am Shireen, and this is the Yumlish Podcast. This episode of the Yumlish Podcast is made possible by Anchor. Anchor is a free and easy way to create a podcast. Their creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor also distributes your podcast for you, so it can be heard across Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Yumlish empowers people with chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes and heart disease to take charge of their health through diet. And this podcast is created to amplify the voices of patients, health professionals, employers, and community members who are working to reduce the risk of these chronic diseases and put your health first. Registered nurse Shirley Roberts talks about her journey to become a nurse, especially working for a community clinic the kinds of services that are provided in this clinic pre-COVID and now with COVID-19 and the impact COVID-19 has had on her patients, especially on those with diabetes. Shirley Roberts is a registered nurse and certified case manager with over 30 years experience in healthcare and management. For the last six and a half years, Shirley has been employed as the clinic nurse manager of the Grace Community Clinic, a faith-based, nonprofit-free charitable clinic located in Grapevine, Texas. But welcome, Shirley. Thank you. Great to have you on. Uh, so with that, Shirley, I want to go into a little bit about your story. What prompted you to become a nurse? What was that journey like? Oh, Wow. I have always wanted to be a nurse. When I was a little child, I wanted to be a nurse. And um, I would read all the book, the novels, the, the stories about nurses, some biographies about nurses. So this was something I always wanted to do. And uh, my journey through school, and then I was later starting college. I started college and then I ended up getting married. And so then life change took some other changes, but then I didn't ever let go of that dream. And so here I am as a nurse and been doing it for over 30 years. Lovely. And then how did you make your way into, into Grace and specifically the community clinic? Well, the beauty about nursing is that there's a lot of avenues you can take. I started out as an ER nurse. I did that for 11 years. I uh, went into doing case management. So I was managing the catastrophic patients, medically complex patients. I did that for probably about uh, five or six years. And then I ended up doing many different things, hospice and lots of other things. And I guess the last uh, seven years before I came to Grace, I was working at a surgical hospital, managing a uh, surgical unit. And uh, I will tell you that the direction that I took, God was speaking to me in my heart. And he was speaking to me probably for about four months that there was something that I needed to do. And I have never experienced that feeling that there was something uh, there was something uh, telling me that I needed to, to just give it to God and that he's going to point me in a direction that I've never taken before. And so uh, during that period of time, we made some other changes and that little gnawing feeling went away for a short period of time, but it still wasn't that God was still speaking to me. And so uh, one day I just happened one Saturday, I opened up my personal email. I'm in work email all the time. So I don't normally don't do that uh, with home email, but I did. And there was this position that was available to run a, the Grace Community Clinic. I was a little familiar with that clinic as I had submitted a volunteer application some time ago, but because I was so busy in uh, my other and my regular job, I wasn't able to do it at that time. So I, uh, I thought, oh my gosh, let me look into this. And I did. And uh, it was a six weeks journey before I made that decision. But after I made that decision, 
I didn't have that gnawing feeling anymore. So it was, I would, I'm sh- I w- I know for sure that this is where I need to be. Oh, that's so lovely. I love that story. So with that, Shelley, I want to I want to learn a little bit about the types of services that you provide to your patients. Generally, pre-COVID, uh, what kind of services do you guys provide there? Okay, well, we are, as you said, a faith-based nonprofit. So there's a lot. We have many programs within Grace, and the program that, of course, I'm tied to right, you know, here is with the clinic. And we provide a medical home for clients that do not have another place to go for a medical home. We provide internal medicine, family practice. Uh, We provide the GYN for the women, the mammograms. We provide a a array of services. We can provide podiatry. We can uh, provide orthopedics uh, consults. We can provide uh, other services, but we're like a medical home. So our clients rely on us a lot, uh, and we're really uh, close to our clients, and, and we're helping them. The big thing with not having, these clients do not have any insurance, the, and most of them are not eligible for other insurance programs. So we have to, our big goal here at Grace is to keep them healthy. And so we do that with a lot of education, a lot of motivation, uh, helping these clients. Uh, A lot of them have comorbidities. And so we're working with them to understand their comorbidities and how they can improve their health. So there's a lot of education that goes on besides the physician visit, the provider visits. Mm -hmm. We're providing a lot of education with diabetes, prediabetes. Uh, We provide uh, nutritional classes, lots of nutritional classes. A registered dietitian that does uh, also works with our clients on a one-on-one and then group classes also. And of course, we've we've provided some services for your your diabetes patients as well. Yes, you did. And that was an amazing six weeks class that we provided for the diabetic clients. And it really gave them uh, another avenue to get education. And also it was very, uh, they were very connected with our reg- the registered dietitian that you had on board. They related to him. They worked, uh, I was just very impressed with that class. And then from that class, I was very impressed with the next three months or so when we started looking at their lab work, they had decreased their hemoglobin A1Cs and they were losing some weight. And, and that was uh, very motivational for them to feel like that these changes that they had learned were really making a difference on their health. One of the one of the biggest things that I like, and, and and thank you for that, because one of the biggest things I like is to is to see that impact at the end of it all, right? Mm-hmm. When you start seeing people sort of change their way they're used right. to eating, and sometimes it is as simple as helping them figure out from an educational standpoint, hey, these are the foods that you're eating, and building that consciousness for this is actually not good for you. And they're like, what? I didn't, you know. So it is. Right. Uh, it's an interesting yeah. journey. It was. It was. It's been a very interesting journey. And anything that we can do to help our clients give them more education, that's what we want to do. We wanted to prevent them from having to go into the hospital and having to seek other services that we're not able to provide here. Yeah. Now, given and so, of course, this was pre-COVID, uh, but given everything with with COVID-19, uh, with with folks, you know, staying at home, not able to come in as much into the clinic, how have things changed? Um, how are you able to provide the services that you normally do in this in this uh, time? Yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting uh, journey in itself because here we were in the middle of March, you know, trying to figure this COVID nineteen out and how we're going to continue to service our clients, and then all of all of a sudden when things started shutting down and this. Uh, you know, shelter at home started, then we had to make, immediately had to make some other changes. And uh, I've been blessed to be a part of the Texas Association of Charitable Clinics and the National Association of Charitable Clinics. And, And one of the things that we looked at immediately was telehealth. And we researched a couple of avenues for that and immediately put that in place in March, towards the end of March. 
and uh, we got the buy-in with our provide our medical director, Dr. Lee, and our, uh, pro our other providers, and we just started doing it. And I don't know how we did it, but we did it. And that was the most. That has been an amazing journey. We are still doing telehealth. We will probably continue doing telehealth uh, through this COVID nineteen, but even maybe after COVID nineteen, because COVID. Telehealth has a place in healthcare, and this is a way we can provide another way to get with our clients and have a face-to-face, -face, because we're doing it with the video, and uh, have another way to, if they can't come into a clinic visit, this is another way to meet their needs. And I like that, that you talk about how telehealth will also be valid you know, post all of, you know, all, all of this COVID and, you know, sort of uh, going through this. But I, I like that point because I think one of the, the main things that telehealth has now done is to say we can provide that service and people don't have to come in. And sometimes it's not it's not only a pandemic. Sometimes it's people just having a busy life and not being able to, you know, physically come in for an appointment. Right. Or they don't have the transportation to get in. You know, their transportation has broke down or they don't have a ride. They thought they were going to have a ride and they don't have a ride. Well, then we can do this. We can even do, you know, what we were talking with the other providers about. We can do some on-site visits once we open up completely. But then we can also offer telehealth also during that clinic time, maybe towards the end of our clinic for the ones that weren't able to come in. With the patients that, that you serve, and first I want to get an idea for the types of patients that you serve, Shirley, but also where have you seen the, the biggest gap in care or even their education about COVID-19? The biggest gap, uh, probably they, they were scared to death when they heard things were closing down and that we were not going to be a they thought we weren't available. So that was one gap. And we had to get on the phone and do a lot of, I know I rely, 80% uh, of my clients are Hispanic and I am not bilingual. So I rely on my two employees and a lot of volunteers to help us with translation with our clients. So we started reaching out to our diabetic clients and our pre-diabetic clients and some of our other clients that have comorbidities to let them know we are still here. We're just not uh, officially doing clinics here, but we are also doing them telehealth. So that was a gap, you know, and I think that we had to hurry up and, and get that education out. So there's a lot of time phone with my employees uh, with that initially. But once the word of mouth got out there, then they were calling us and, and realizing, and, and Grace, besides this, we have a food pantry and we have client services. And so they had to find another way, you know, to service it. So instead of clients coming in and shopping in the food pantry, they had to figure out, okay, they're putting boxes together and then they're delivering they will drive do a drive through and pick those boxes up but we had to educate them also to let them know we're still we're still here even though covid-19 is going on and you know one of the hard things that i will point out is with our clientele it's a low income and a lot of, and most of our clients do work but they're working in a service organization and so they're working in hotels they're working in restaurants well those were immediately you know they started closing down all those restaurants uh and so that was hard for them because uh, you know probably 90 something percent of our clients lost their jobs and so here they are home with no income. So that education to get out that Grace is here. We have a client services that can see if we can assist them temporarily with their rent or, or help with a utility bill or something to keep them afloat till things started opening up again. That's one of the wonderful things I, that I admire about Grace because you're not only looking at it from one lens, but you sort of have this, this multi-lens approach to where you're looking at the, the health and wellness, you're also looking at financial assistance, you're also looking at food access. I, I love how all of those different components sort of come together and provide a comprehensive service rather than services in silos. 
And I think with the, we have 60 some odd employees at Grace. And I think one of the things, you know, because we had to close our stores down. We have three resale stores and we have a donation station and they had to close down just like our other community you know, stores and things had to close down. And so just figuring out another way to serve them and figuring out how we could use our employees and maybe put them in different areas to keep them, you know, from, um, having to stay home and some of them did have to stay home for a little bit till we could start opening up again. But then, you know, when you look at the community as a whole, I guess I look at, you know, my, our clients here at Grace, usually they don't have jobs they can do at home. So, you know, a lot of employers were able to take some of these uh, employees and put them working at home, but our clients didn't have that option. So Grace is, was even more important. Uh, uh, places like Grace were important to help during that period of time to get them back on their feet. Has there been, from a from the clinic side, has there been an impact on their health from the, the stress, the anxiety, just yes. the, yes. the uncertainty? There has been, and we're seeing people, and the blessing here, and I, I could use another counselor or two, we're seeing them being, uh, being more open to counseling, and that's a service that we provide here, so we were able to do that telehealth too, and so uh, we're seeing more clients need that service, we see more stress uh, in the community, and I think that we just have to be open to helping these people during this period of time. It's called a stress. It's caused stress to, for us too, because you know to think that we had to change a whole way of doing business, and but to to ensure that we are still providing. And I think I was scared at one point of that we weren't going to be able to provide. Maybe don't you know we have donated medications, over the counter medications, and that's a big piece of their treatment. And and donated insulin. So what if we couldn't provide that, and what would happen? And uh, the blessing that we have been able to is to continue doing that, but in a different way. Uh, I think one of the other things is the well woman visits and the mammograms. Those have had to uh, put, be put on hold for a, a few months during the, this time. And we use Texas Health Mobile Unit for our mammograms. And they're going to, st hopefully we're going to be starting back up. They thought maybe they were going to start up in May, but they're not going to be able to. So we're hoping in June we'll be able to get that back on uh, for a service because that is a service that is needed for these ladies. And we have identified, I know last year we had, I think, three clients that we had, three or four clients that we identified with breast cancer. If we hadn't had that service, those ladies wouldn't have had that, you know, and they would have been more advanced before it got diagnosed. So the blessing is that we'll be able to pick that back up next month. And our well womans are going to start the end of this month. I have two GYN doctors that, uh, that are volunteers for us that will uh, be here on the 28th and the 29th. And all of this is going to be done. All of, Everybody that once we start back up, we're going to be doing pre-screenings. We're going to make sure that we don't bring someone in that could be be, have a condition that could, you know, it could be contagious. We could have COVID-19. So there's a lot of behind the scenes we'll be doing. That's great. So a lot of what we'll have to do, you know, to keep everybody safe, to keep our clients safe, our employees safe, and, our, you know, all of our volunteers safe. Right. So you just have to screen them and, and make sure they're, they're okay to come in and then provide service as, as you were before. You know, so. and the beauty of everything is that we're working together as a community. And Tar I, I will say Tarrant County, I'm so blessed to be in Tarrant County and Dallas is doing a great job too. But Tarrant mm -hmm. County has a pre-screening tool. And so does our electronic health record, but it's a little bit more detailed with Tarrant County Health Department. And we're helping our clients uh, if they feel like they have symptoms. Uh, we're doing uh, helping them with that pre-screening tool. And we've had a couple that once we do this pre-screening tool, if they show that they need to have, be tested, then we can make an appointment for them to get tested through Tarrant County uh, at one of the sites. And that's a blessing. Lovely. Um, so you talked about all the ways in which you're helping folks, Shirley. How can folks learn to find a way to help you? What are what are the needs of the of the clinic? How can folks sort of get plugged in and, and be able to help? 
Well, with Grace, we can't do it without our community support. So one of the things they can do, they can go online at Grace grapevine.org on our website and there is a list of food needs there's a list of over-the-counter medication needs that are there uh, they're also they can go on amazon and order things through amazon that will go directly and be delivered to grace uh, that's another way to do that and it's all on the website. And then, you know, there's always, we appreciate all the financial donations that have come in during this period of time to really help us help with these clients that need assistance with their utilities and their rent and things like that. So there's always that way. And then the other, I will always say, as if, if none of that is something that someone can do, they can pray for us and pray for our clients and help us during this period of time. Uh, we've been getting some wonderful, wonderful donations, and I've just been really amazed. Uh, PPE, which is personal protective equipment, that's something that's a shortage across you know the country. And we have been blessed just recently. People have made face masks for us. People have donated PPE for us. Uh, I've had uh, students that in high school that, and it was on the news a few weeks ago, they made face masks. The, this boy got this idea. His mom is a anesthesiologist and he wanted to get back and do something to help with this PPE shortage. So he developed a way to make face shields and he had two other students help him and this private school in South Lake Clarendon, and they have been amazing. They had delivered a hundred face shields to us. They're also going out in the community and delivering for, to some of the other charitable clinics to help them with this need. Because once we open up, we're going to be wearing PPE. We're going to be needing to wear these protective things to protect ourselves and our clients. Lovely. And, and that's such a such an endearing story when we have students and, and young members of the community oh, actually God. step in and yeah and provide this. That, this that was so, I'm so impressed uh, with these guys that did this and, and just, oh my gosh, their servant hearts is wonderful. Lovely. So with that, Shirley, we're toward the end of the episode. I, lo I would love to ask at this point, how can people connect with you, learn more about your work? Well, go on gracegreatrun.org and you can find, I'm Shirley Roberts, you can find my my email address, my te uh, work telephone number. You can look at some of our other programs that we have and you can uh, also communicate with them directly. Sounds great. Well, it was a pleasure having you on, Shirley. And thank you, Shireen, for everything you're doing to help our community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Yumlish podcast with Shireen. If you like our show and want to learn more, you can find information at yumlish.com. You can also leave us a review here. We will see you at the next one. And remember, your health always comes first. <laughs>